Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I am back from Japan. An Osaka-based member of my trade association decided a while back that it was way past time for my first trip to Japan, so they flew me and Amy over for a week. I had business meetings the first three days, but got in some sightseeing in Kyoto and Tokyo after that. Amy got to do a bunch more exploring while I was busy being Mr. Busy. Uh, so between that and the fantastic business dinners and the, the wonderful hotels they put us up in, it was a pretty amazing week all around. No podcasts came out of it, but uh, I actually did get some leads for potential guests for future visits. And I am hoping that uh, everybody business-related felt that it was worthwhile enough to um, help pay for aforementioned future visits. Um, I've been posting pictures from the trip on my Instagram account, which is VMS Pod, and Amy's posted some great ones, uh, both at Amy Roth and Amy Roth Photo. The latter is her food-related pictures, which will make you drool. Um, my big achievement during the trip occurred on the last morning there, and it was, like I say, a great week all around, really good conversations, good meetings. Um, but the thing was, I fa finally managed to get in a legit run for the first time in like more than three months. So I've been dealing with an injury, but decided that hell or high water, I was going to run the 5K loop around the Imperial Palace and gardens in Tokyo. Um, partly, this was to test my knee calf issue, but mostly it was to um, to find out if I still had the will to run and not self-sabotage myself into quitting, which is where I was when I first began running in, in 2018. Um, I am happy to report I did the loop without giving myself an excuse to stop, thought about those excuses during the run, but didn't entertain them enough to, to break stride at all. My time wasn't phenomenal. I wasn't pushing for a great time. I just wanted to complete the run and turned out I was getting faster with each mile. So that was pretty good. My calf also felt good after that, as well as the 12 hour flight home, uh, during, after which we landed, uh, about two hours before we took off based on the 14 hour time difference. Anyway, um, the upshot is I managed to run and, and managed to do it around a, an amazing landmark in Tokyo. My thighs, I should mention, are sore as hell from the fact that I have not run in three plus months, but that's another story. That'll fix itself. Anyway, I will talk more about the Japan trip in future episodes, I'm sure, because I'm still kind of processing the observations and other stuff that came out of it and not wanting to seem like I am the first Western person ever to visit Japan. So anyway, let's get to this week's conversation. Now, my guest this time around is Cassandra Kaw, a writer of supernatural horror, uh, among other subjects. I got turned on to Cassandra's work when I was setting up last week's episode with Richard Kadri. See, they both were visiting from uh, out of town for a reading at KGB bar, and Richard sang Cassandra's praises as a really good writer and a fun potential pod guest. I checked out a few of her novellas and decided he was right. Food of the Gods, uh, the first one I read, which features a chef who prepares dishes from freshly killed human bodies for his clients, who are gods and demons. 
turns out to actually be more lighthearted than the noir series that I also read that began with Hammers on Bone, or Hammers on Bone as the, the name of the, the first one. They both have their Cthulhu-esque elements, which we get into during the episode, but they take things in some interesting directions. Now, Cassandra's also part of the video game world, starting out by writing about the industry and now working as a game designer. And I'm interested in that space as a concept and how it mirrors both contemporary culture and the, the literary publishing industry and, and how the modes of storytelling overlap and, and vary again. Which is to say, I don't actually play video games because I'm afraid my compulsive personality would get the better of me. Or worse of me, I guess. Anyway, Cassandra, good writer, lots of elements to her life and her story. So I was awfully glad Richard connected us for a morning podcast at the hotel they were staying in in Jersey City during this NYC trip. Now, as far as caveats go, there's some static on my channel, but that goes away after the first two or three minutes. Sorry, but I didn't want to splice in the backup recorder, which has a very different sound quality uh, because of how we kind of set up the, the physical layout there. Anyway, that's the only caveat I can come up with. And here is Cassandra's bio from a recent book. Cassandra Kaw writes many things. Mostly these days, she writes horror and video games and occasional flirtations with chick lit. Her work can be found in venues such as Clark's World, Fireside Fiction, Uncanny, Lightspeed, Nightmare, and more. A Song for Quiet was her latest novella from Tor.com, a piece of Lovecraftian Southern Gothic that she worries will confuse those who purchased Barely a Lady, and that's B-E-A-R-L-Y, uh, her frothy paranormal romantic comedy. Her books, as I mentioned, include Food of the Gods and Hammers on Bone. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Cassandra Kaw. So tell me about the murder hotel. We're, we're in a murder hotel. When did you realize you were in for it? I wouldn't say it's exactly a murder hotel, but just walking up the corridors, seeing things grow progressively more dilapidated was just a little bit disconcerting. It reminds me slightly too much of another place I've stayed in before in Eureka, Oregon, which had doors that opened into black and charred rooms and doors that opened into a tree uh, tree story drop for no reason whatsoever <laughs> in general um never allow me to choose airbnbs especially if you're sharing with me because i have really bad luck i i've always avoided the the whole phenomenon and i'm lucky because i do a lot of business travel for actual business as opposed to to you know the fun stuff like this um because i'm always assuming uh video cameras and bed bugs those are just my, my two assumptions but i'm sure this place will work great for you that's that's you know that's reassuring. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just filled with paranoia about this stuff. But is it giving you good and, and grotesque ideas for, for more fiction? Yep. Uh, I'm sleeping on a couch, so every time the pipes go off, I expect to see a face at the window, and that is going to haunt me for a while. So yes, <laughs> something will come out of it. That or a nightmare. Tell me where, uh, where fiction and horror in particular started for you. Um... I have wondered about it very often, but I suspect it comes from the fact that my parents were not very great parents. And for some bizarre reason, they decided between the ages of four and nine were the best possible times to inflict John Carpenter's The Thing <laughs> on a small child. And they wouldn't let me close my eyes for some reason. And it was just this endless deluge of like body horror growing up. I think kind of came from there. I'm fairly certain childhood trauma. Have and they have they owned up to it? No. Are they okay? Do they take any responsibility for your your career choices down the line? No. I I wanted to be a forensic spe specialist at some point, and they refused. So I think they refused to acknowledge the fact that happened. <laughs> and and with the thing in particular, was there a degree of of never quite trusting that they were actually themselves? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and with everyone else I've ever met ever since. Yeah, I, I won't show you any of my hideous scars then. Um, <laughs> and the, the, the sense of gore and, and, you know, having read a couple of the books, the combination of gore and, and cooking. Um, <laughs> no, no, it just, you know, gets me sort of wondering about, you know, the threads and, and where that begins for you. Um, 
Um, and how it evolved? Well, for up till, I guess, 2019, really, um, I was basically traveling repeatedly across the world for about a decade. And one of the ways I got room and board was learning to be an extremely good cook. Because what I discovered is people let you sleep on the sofa if you clean up after them and leave them three course meals and then go back to hiding on the sofa. <laughs> so that sort of correlated to the fact that I think I've always been fascinated with the role of violence in our lives and how Hollywood and media in general has sanitized it. And even with a lot of body horror stuff, what you see is a lot of red intestines, not much of the other organs. Mm -hmm. And I guess that just kind of desensitizes people a lot. They assume that pain happens, stops, no one thinks about the kind of effects that, let's say, cutting someone's large intestine open would inflict on the human body, the kind of shock, the kind of horror, the smell, the bowel and everything else that happens. And because I tend to handle a lot of um, raw meat and all of the other things that are related to it, making stock and stuff, paying attention to how marrow comes out, that kind of slowly combined over the years. So with the, the forensics goal, did you also have a cuisine or cook type chef, you know, aspiration in life? Or is this really just, you know, hobby enough to, to get you by? It wasn't even a hobby enough to get me by kind of thing. It was a this is how I do not have to pay rent because at okay. one point in my <laughs> life I was broke enough that that was partially how I was getting room and board. And the other way I was getting room and board was dancing in the subways of New York for about six months, 10 hours a day just to get lunch the next day. What were you dancing to? Um, Whatever the group was playing at that point. Okay. I wasn't sure if you had a, you're one of those people with the boom box and, and all no, that. I was, you were with I, the, I was with a group. Uh, in fact, I think they're still there in Union Square today. How did that originate? Where did that come from? Um, I did dance a long time ago, a uh, ballroom Latin in college that led into belly dancing, a little bit of hip hop. And my first weekend in New York, I saw the dance group and I was kind of bouncing around in the corner, really happy at the sight of it because it was like something out of a movie. And the guy that was in charge of the dance troupe took one look at me, ran across the crowd, grabbed me by the arm, dragged me back to them. And I kind of started dancing with them. And later on, I discovered you can kind of get like about $750 a day doing that, which is really not bad. It still gets kind of divided be between the amount of dances that are there at the present day. But it was a good way of making money. That kind of one thing led to another. And keeps you in shape. It got me in shape. It was the be I was in the best shape of my life, also because I was starving at the time. Yeah, I guess that's the, the flip side of it is, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Talk about travel. And so where you began and what kind of sent you circling the, the planet? Um, so after my parents told me, no, you are not playing with corpses as a career. We refuse. <laughs> Absolutely not. The strong armed me into becoming a programmer. And after a while, I ended up making a website for a client who asked me to do articles for him. And I noticed no one was paying any attention to it. And that led to me thinking, okay, I was based in Malaysia and everything about the games industry was all the way in North America and in London. And I got into my head that the best way to get any amount of attention was to go all the way to North America and just follow the convention circuits, meeting everyone I knew. So I flew to San Francisco, crashed on the couch of a person whose picture I'd never seen before. In retrospect, that was possibly a fatal decision. <laughs> It went from San Francisco to Boston to New York uh, to Sweden and it kept going. And I kept flying back and forth between Malaysia and the rest of the tra um, places I traveled to. But after a while, 40-hour flights just stopped being appealing. So I would just slowly progress across the globe in about 10-hour increments. Yeah. And then after a few years, I was like, I'm used to this. I don't know how to settle down anymore. Yeah. And that kept going for 10 years. It reminds me of the, uh, uh, I'm probably dating myself here, Thomas Dolby single, I Live in a Suitcase. Yes. That, uh, yeah, it's just, I had that stretch when I'd have business travel, especially in the fall. It would just be four or five trade shows in a row. And it was, I could unpack. But, you know, two days from now, I'm just loading everything back in. And, and as opposed to turning it into a lifestyle like you. That's, that's... Um, I still have trouble remembering to unpack. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, you ever have, do you ever have the uh, 
sitting on a plane and not remembering where you're you're yes, going okay. all the time just making sure that's that's because it's been on the runway that i had the i know what trade show i'm going to can't remember what city i'm headed to but i must be going to the right place because they took my ticket and, and let me on board but so talk about writing. Where did uh, fiction writing versus the the articles and such mm -hmm. you talked about uh, uh, earlier for the the sites you were doing? Where did writing begin? Um, I was fascinated with writing as any nerd was as a child um, that got sidelined by being a programmer and getting into AI and various other things. And eventually, from there, and while I was traveling, I got into video games journalism that paid terribly. And that progressed into tech journalism, which was kind of how I encountered video game writing. And I got to writing She Remembered Caterpillars first, I think, which was a really odd children's game about invasive brain surgery. <laughs> which sort of sounds like it's up your alley. It is. And I'm really surprised that German, Germany liked it enough to give an award for best kids game. And I'm still trying to figure out why. <laughs> <laughs> this does not seem to like the right content, but maybe I don't have the right cultural um, perspective on that. But kind of from there, that led to somebody asking me to write a tie-in novel. And after I did the tie-in novel, I was like, maybe I can try an original thing. And that kind of snowballed. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first legit author you met? Oh, my God. Uh... And have you had freakouts over meeting, you know, any sort of literary idols? I don't remember the first legit author that I met, but I do remember meeting um, Frances Harding, who continues to be a little bit of a hero to me. Um, to give a little bit of perspective, I found a book of hers, A Face Like Glass, read it, devoured it. It was about 700 pages, went off and just burned through her entire backlist, utterly fascinated with the way that she used language. It glittered. It was beautiful. And while I was looking for more, I realized that she was right. All her books were intended for 10 year olds somehow. Yeah. And it fascinated me that you did not need a very great vocabulary. You did not need $5 words or big adult concepts to be able to deliver gorgeous prose. And so she is an idol. I have freely admitted it to it many, many times. And I remember meeting her at a convention once, getting up the courage running up to her and bowing down so hard my forehead smacked into my knee and just squeaking how much I loved her. And for some reason, she was gracious enough to continue being friends with me after that <laughs> instead of running away from the crazy fan. Yeah, the we're not worthy thing does get a little uh, different uh, artists have different uh, responses to that, that sort of stuff. But but yeah, it's it's actually something I want to get to the various communities you belong mm -hmm. to um or that you you take part in uh, there's the the gaming world mm -hmm. there's writing in fiction but also being a fan mm -hmm. um do you see well differences among the 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 cultures and the way people relate to each other within the the various communities you belong to um i don't spend enough time or being part of a fan community because yeah. I am a chronic workaholic, mm -hmm. but I actually think there's a lot of similarities between the world of video games and the world of publishing in general. So much of it is people trying to break into a monolith and they're really closely knit. Everyone's really encouraging to each other. I guess the only real difference is video games has money and publishing does not. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of figured that's a, a major differentiator between them. But even then, there is just that sense of strong community. Um, everyone's pushing each other to get better rates. Everyone's sharing information. Everyone's pushing against um, the corporations, trying to shake it down to offer more space to the marginalized. And it's, real, it's been good. Yeah. How's that changed over the time you've been in the, the field? Ooh. Within gaming first, and then we'll, we'll talk about the, the, the fiction side. Um, I think I've been lucky enough to get into video games when um, a push for diversity was becoming a thing. But people seem a lot more respectful these days about 
um, other cultures and marginalizations. I remember very early on, about a decade ago, I had a friend who is a devout, I still have a friend, sorry, Rami, who is a devout Muslim. And we were in a convention and people would, it was Ramadan, people would keep trying to shove meat at him. They're like, come on, eat. And he's like, no, I'm a Muslim. I am fasting. I can't eat till Sunday. No, it's fine. God doesn't exist. <laughs> Go eat. Yeah. And if it wasn't that, it would be people going, here, have some alcohol. And he's right. like, again, Muslim. <laughs> about. Can't do it. Yeah. Um, that has become a lot less. I've also noticed very interestingly, both in terms of publishing and in terms of video games, there is a lot more um, effort in getting get-togethers that doesn't use alcohol, mm-hmm. um, mostly because people worry about each other's safety. So they're like tea parties, um, going out for ice cream. So it's been interesting. And I think social media has been really good for that. Yeah. Just broadcasting voices instead of keeping people hiding and worried about what your opinions mean and so forth. Mm-hmm. And then within the writing field? I spent too much time working to be part of that good, as much. Good. That's that's for the best. You know, all I do is go to ReaderCon and a couple of, of you know, festivals, more in the comic space than in the, the FNSF world. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I always wonder about people who follow the circuit actually getting stuff done. Um, if they're... I, I wish I could. I just don't have the time. <laughs> the few cons that I've managed to go to, they've been beautiful, inclusive. Everyone has been great and very supportive of each other. Mm-hmm. And talk about the uh, the reading you had this week yeah. on the KGB bar. Mm-hmm. How did the what did you read from, and you know what sort of audience were you expecting versus what you got? I was expecting tables to be filled because it was a very small bar. I was not expecting it to be standing room only, or having as much support as I got. Um, a lot of friends came out that I wasn't expecting to see. I think I spent the first forty five minutes sitting down, turning around, trying to talk to friends, looking over, going, friends, and just bouncing out of my seat every like two minutes. And it was great. It was, I'm fairly certain it was Richard's fault that there were so many people there, but I'm going to pretend (laughs) at least halfway there for me. And I read from an upcoming novella that I'm still not sure if I'm allowed to talk about, because on one hand, it's not a noun. On the other... Your your editor mentioned it to me when I asked her about you know, getting together with you. So I'm going to take that as it exists. I I know. So it's just this weird gray yeah. area. We'll but let it go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what's home for you? Oh, God. Yeah. That's yeah, an interesting besides question. Besides the suitcase, um, you know. I recently moved to Montreal about six months ago to work with Ubisoft. And that is slowly becoming home. But... I think my usual answer is home is the airport. Yeah. I am oddly familiar with airports and I guess home in many ways is landmarks in various cities. When I travel, I need to go certain places. I need to visit certain parks, certain monuments, brush my hand against them. And Are these things you knew about beforehand or just repetitive ones from returning to cities? Repetitive ones from returning to cities and slightly terminal desire to walk across the length of every city I've ever spent any time in. Um, I've actually trekked vertically across New York several times before. Mm. So yeah, from repetitive walking around. During the, um, the giant blackout in 2003, maybe 2004, uh, I live in Northern New Jersey, about 25 miles from the city Mm -hmm. and a pal of mine called, from New York to ask, you know, how far I was from, from there. I said, ah, 25 miles from the bridge. Oh, um, how far is Scarsdale? And I said that, Adam, are, are you walking out of New York because of the blackout? He's like, yeah. I was oh like, my I'll, God. I'll meet you at the bridge. Uh, just, oh you know, I'll, I'll drive to the GW. Let's, you know, you're, you're... so from f- uh, the West fifties, he walked up to the one eighties and then, then across, but oh, was wow. prepared to, to go up to Westchester. Apparently. Um, the great thing about it was, uh, I figured we were told it was a blackout, but who knows? Could be zombie apocalypse. You have no idea what it is. So I grabbed, uh, before heading out, a baseball bat and a big knife for the the car. <laughs> and I go walking across the bridge. Didn't bring them with me, but uh, lots of people are leaving New York, walking across. And then uh, there was just this one guy, black guy, uh, T-shirt, huge muscles, just kind of striding uh, across the bridge, leaving New York. 
with a golf club under his arm. And I thought, that dude's thinking the same thing I'm thinking. <laughs> you don't know. Could be a zombie apocalypse, and I'm not letting them get in a biting range. And he was just ready to, to wipe out whatever <laughs> was coming. As it turned out, not a zombie apocalypse. And Adam and I spent a couple of days back in Jersey before they got power back and sent them to New York. But, oh, that's awesome. But yeah, I, I don't think I've walked the full length of the city at, at any point, um, north, south, like that. Um, favorite city to, to visit, which is different than home, because mm. you clearly are home in your head. Edinburgh, I think, yeah. at a moment. Um, I remember going out of my Airbnb on the first day, walking up to High Street and just finding the castle and just standing there and going, why is there a castle, a full-blown <laughs> castle in the middle of the damn city? And yeah, it has to be Edinburgh. I spent a few months there and I kept finding new staircases, new pathways, new tunnels kept just wandering up and down and it was this glorious mix of modern technology modern infrastructure and just ancient ruins mm -hmm. i loved it yeah it's currently my favorite city we won't tell montreal that's that's okay montreal yeah. knows i love her in a different way yeah. she understands i've only been once i had a, a trade show in quebec city and then uh, my wife and i spent a couple of days in montreal after um sampling poutine and, and Schwartz's and, and all that stuff. But, you know, you, you, you do what you have to. Oh, I mean, I still don't understand the appeal of poutine. It's still something that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's from down south, so there's a different uh, <laughs> d different vibe when it comes to everything being fried, Fair I, enough. I guess. <laughs> you know. So tell me about cannibalism. And, <laughs> <laughs> and making a, a lead character who's a cannibal chef. Where did the, uh, where did the Rupert Wong concept begin for you? Um, I think I'd read a lot of horror that involved cannibalism, and I was really curious about the idea of turning the human body into fine cuisine. I have no personal fascination with it. I've never had a desire to eat human flesh, but just the concept of turning about 180 pounds into a full seven course meal was just kind of oddly appealing. Mm. And also in very many ways, it was my first attempt at um, doing a book. So I tried to throw as many things together as possible. Kind of worked. Yeah. It was a really frenetic little novella looking back at it, but I'm still proud of the thing. Mm -hmm. you know, what do you feel you got better at in terms of writing fiction? Over the last, well, over the, the, the stories and novellas so far? Um, learning to let them get bigger. Mm -hmm. um, I have a background as a journalist, so... Compression yes, is... Yeah. Being terse and being tense about everything is definitely a necessity. You get to the point and trying to deprogram myself of that was a little bit difficult. But as the years progress, um, I'm getting better at figuring that out. I'm getting better at just dropping um, crumbs in the beginning, trying to figure out how those connect to the future, trying to give my characters room to breathe. It's still a work in progress. I'm still a journalist at heart. Yeah. yeah how much has a good editor helped given uh, I, I I was corresponding with Ellen Datlow, uh, just mentioning that we were recording and, and she mentioned editing you, but, you know, nothing about the process of doing that, but has, you know, has been of benefit or have you learned things from that, that process of? It has absolutely been in benefit. I have loved basically all of the editors I've worked with, um, having a different perspective, having somebody who understands how a story works on a more Lar on a larger scale has been amazing having them look into the characters demand that I answer certain things demand that I capitalize on certain things it's been challenging but just kind of it's kind of been wonderful um as always I want to make a tiny shout out to Charlie Finley of um FNSF mm -hmm. um a lot of my success today really has everything to do with him I sent him stories long ago and he would send back, send back feedback that I would use and inevitably the feedback would lead to the story being sold and I would tell him about it. 
And so and in his infinite compassion, he would just increase the length of his feedback. And I think at one point I was getting like three, four paragraphs worth of notes in a rejection letter. Yeah. And those were all really useful. And it was because of him that Hammers and Bone kind of happened. It was originally a 3,000 word story. And he gave me this detailed letter saying he loved it, but it all summed up to this story needs room to breathe. And apparently it needed 14,500 more words to breathe. <laughs> Do you think uh, long, long form? You have the, the novel. Do you have the 12 novel series like Richard in you <laughs> at, at this point? <laughs> Um, I'm working up to it. Yeah. I'm working up to it. There's still a lot of progress before that. Yeah. Tell me about Lovecraft. Ooh. The things that I've read so far have, have been, uh, Lovecraft elements, at least. I, I don't want to say inspired necessarily, but, mm -hmm. but the mythos and such, you know, permeate a lot of that. Where did that, uh, start for you? And given the problematic nature of Lovecraft as a person, blah, blah, blah. Um, um. I think Lovecraft was very deeply afraid as a human being, more than anything else. And it wasn't just xenophobia and hatred that came out of nowhere. Everyone um, externalizes their fears in different ways. Some people reach out, some people try to learn about it. And I guess he just responded by being utterly terrified. And, and think, scaring the shit out of other people, though. But, but yeah, you mm. know. <laughs> And well, I think that is par and course for every horror writer in very many ways. Um, you try to explain why you're afraid of a thing. And it was just unfortunately a pity that his fear connected to very deep root of racism. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that drew me to him in terms of using Lovecraftian elements was how much he saw horror in things that happened in the neighborhood and town, how much he thought that the worst of the world and monsters could live among us. And that sort of in part led me to thinking for Hammers and Bone, which kind of came out as a result of finding out of a real life um, child abuse case and how many people made excuses for the abuser, how many people said, oh, he was a nice guy. How do we not realize it? Oh, we should have seen the signs. And I've seen examples of that across my life, um, people being very surprised that a person they knew was actually horrible because they were like, yeah, that was this one instance. They were a bad person, yeah. but I don't think they were capable of that. And so they kind of combined together into me wondering how many of us are willing to go, oh, the noises and the thumping that we hear across the room are not, a, you know, a tentacle monster. It's just some guy accidentally bumping against a wall. Oh, that scream was probably a very strange scream of pleasure from a couple <laughs> ha having sex, you know. Yeah. Or the the pipes in the, in the room and the face. I'm in the not going to sleep tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's better than bed bugs. That's all I can say. Oh, no. <laughs> Do you have a, a writing routine or practice, given that you're balancing day job with with fiction? Do you have time regularly or you know, how do you write, I guess? Um, I think I think I benefit from the fact that I have always had a fairly regimented schedule. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time as a freelancer and I've got very used to the idea of breaking down my entire day by the half hour. So nowadays it's just, all right, I'm at work for eight hours. I'm in the gym for an hour and a half. Then it's about an hour to walk to and fro, hour for food and everything else is for sleep and writing. Mm -hmm. So just, I'm good at scheduling. Gotcha. And the coffee has to, to come in at, at oh God, yeah. times. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just, just making sure. Oh God. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've, I've read you talk about it before, but the, the differences and similarities in writing for games versus writing fiction. And then again, you've already talked about how the journalism mm -hmm. uh, trains you in a different way. But um, when it comes to those two different types of narratives, gaming versus uh, fiction, how do they work together? Do they feed off each other at all or, or feed in? Or are you really of two different sort of writing minds when you're working on one versus the other? I think it's definitely of two different writing minds. Um, novels, you are trusting the reader to follow you from the beginning to, to the end because they bought your book and, well, it's on them if they just kind of run away halfway. 
with games on the other hand you're working the idea that attention spans are going to be scattered people are going to approach it at different times and even if you have a full narrative people are just kind of going to walk off they're going to be like oh shiny what's going on over there and just leave for like 20 hours to explore a card game and then you need to figure out the ways of just kind of moving it back and so even though you're doing something like that you're not allowed to explicitly make it obvious so it's different it's definitely two schools of thought and i'm always surprised when i hear that um, novelists or screenwriters hope to approach video games as an easy fallback plan because they're completely different disciplines yeah but w did it teach you anything in terms of audience expectation it, did either one teach you about audience expectation in a way that benefited the other? Or again, was it really a, that's why this is so different than that in terms of, of what an audience wants? Video game writing really cemented the idea that foreshadowing and dropping clues and keeping things consistent was utterly necessary. Mm -hmm. um, just so my boss giggles when he hears this podcast, and I know he will listen to it. One of the things he taught me, and he is a Bioware alumni, he, I would write um, dialogue. And I was like, no, 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 no. Um, I can just keep going. The writer, um, the reader and the player is going to understand this. He's going to remember the exact point. And he's like, that's not, that's not how video games work. That is absolutely not. You're going to have to keep giving them keywords. And I'm like... No, 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 no. This is, I think you're wrong. I think you're underestimating the intelligence of the player. And uh, when I gave my content over um, to one of our level designers to test, and he had helped me build this quest. I'm not going to say which company, but one of them. Um, he had helped me build this quest. And despite that, once, once he was done with the testing, he turns around and looks at me and goes, was there a son ever mentioned it? And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> we have spent six months on this. And I'm like, and you we were here explicitly to test this thing. <laughs> Sweet Lord, how did this happen? Oops. Yeah, so <laughs> video games taught me the importance of foreshadowing and ensuring that the reader's attention is held throughout. And the collaborative nature of that versus uh, is writing really solo i guess uh, uh non-gaming writing uh you know a solo pursuit versus a a you know a collaborative effort again with testers and everything else that you'd have in the gaming world mm -hmm. or are they very similar in terms of the relationship you have with an editor um i think different writers have different approaches to it i know friends and peers who have large networks of beta readers and early readers but for me it's always been solo work mm -hmm. it's just how i'm wired yeah and when it comes to the difference between that and working in in gaming where again you're working with the boss the testers and everything else um does it strike you as as you know markedly different in those terms um or is it again why writing is is you know the thing you pursue it's definitely a far more collaborative effort there are a lot of cycles a lot of iterations a lot more expectations and with how visuals and sound and everything comes together. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's different. It's very much a collaborative work, whether you like it or not. Tell me about language. You, English is your third? Yes. Okay. What is that? Well, Joseph Conrad is the guy I always think of in those terms because English was like his fifth language. Mm -hmm. And yet, not even, and yet, um, his English was so carefully measured and understood the ins and outs of it really well. Um do you see an advantage along those lines in not having English as a native language in terms of having to understand it and how it works, learning it a little uh, little later? Um, I actually felt it was a little bit of a disadvantage because I still find myself caught on certain grammatical um, ideas and rules mm -hmm. that everyone seems to understand intrinsically. And I just have no concept of because most of my English was picked up via osmosis. Mm -hmm. um, I never really had proper education in it. Most of it was a result of a lot of voracious reading. And occasionally there is um, one of my earliest languages is tonal. So there's been like weird mixes of it. Yeah. 
and it doesn't always work. I kind of wish that I had a more, a better foundation in English when I roll with what I have. Do you write in anything other than English? Um, no, I, I, I'm perfectly conversant in writing Malay. I unfortunately cannot write in any of the Chinese dialects I know, mm -hmm. but no, I write primarily in English. Okay. I just wasn't sure if there was a sense of, you know, translation in process or, or. There, there is definitely a sense of translation process, whether um, speaking or writing. And the best way I've been able to describe it is um, imagine watching a, like a TV show and seeing like four different um, subtitles at the bottom. And you, you're, if you know all of them, you're always constantly aware of the translations that's going on. As if in my head, it is entirely verbal. And I keep glancing to and fro. And if I'm communicating with someone, the correct subtitle bounces up. Yeah. But I can still sort of see every single translation for it. And when I'm learning a new language, French, for example, it kind of bobs up and I see words. And then there's this weird gray static in my head for the words I don't recognize. And it goes back to things that I comprehend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of like that. Interesting. And this whole synesthetic thing also that just, just permeates your, your, yes. your world. Yeah. It's a, uh, there's a post I wrote many years ago because once upon a time people used to blog, um, about, about 10 or 12 different translations of one line of, of Tolstoy that, uh, there are ones that are more grammatically correct than the one that I mm -hmm. love the most, but you know, I decided. Mm -hmm. That that Aylmer Maud one is the one that I I I'll live with, even though Pavir and Volokonsky and all these other ones are technically more more appropriate. But what am I missing by um, completely avoiding games and gaming <laughs> culture? By the way, because because I was proto video game kid. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I was born in seventy one, so and I came of age with arcades and spent mm -hmm. all my time. You know, my fear when I was a teen was that I would die and there'd be a recording angel who was going to say how many quarters and how much time I really blew, oh my God. you know, playing video games. Now it's, you know, hours spent with porn, but, but, you know, at the time though, the, the video game thing really, really ate my life up, but I managed to get away from that in college and onwards. Um, and it turns out it's absolutely massively important to, to our world today. Mm -hmm. And I have no perspective on it in the slightest. So, um, what do games mean to you and what do you see them in terms of the, their culture and how they, they intersect with, the day to day. Um, I'm actually going to talk about this in Barcelona in oh god, two weeks. Okay. <laughs> Oof, that's terrifying. Um, but games are absolutely amazing in terms of how they draw you into the lives of someone else. Media has tried it very often. Books, film, radio. We're trying to, as creatives, constantly tell people to live within someone else's life. But video games has a way because of the interactive element of going a little bit further. And one of my current favorite examples, and I'm pretty certain I've talked about this to death at this point. I'm slightly sick of hearing myself talk about it, <laughs> but I think it's fundamentally important. There is a game called uh, Life is Strange 2. Mm -hmm. And I randomly picked it up because I was still like, try it out. Try it out the Xbox Game Pass. And I was like, sure, I like the first game. Let's see where it goes. And he opens with two teenagers talking, and it's the most banal possible thing. And I'm like, uh, let's get to a natural stopping point. This is clearly just the introduction. I feel bad not giving this the opportunity. And so I get my character back to his home. And the first thing we see is his father and his brother arguing about a piece of chocolate. And it's a very typical moment. I'm immediately slightly invested against my better judgment. And they turn to me, all right, who picks it? And there is a third option where you can kind of go, it is mine. <laughs> so I take it. And they talk a little bit more and feeling a little bit warmer towards them. And the part where it becomes particularly interesting is the character, um, the character you're playing was told to gather snacks for a party. But... There was no information, and with a lot of video games, it's just kind of there. You pick it up and you leave. So I walk in, and it's this incredibly detailed house, clearly owned by a single father trying to run a home business and have two sons at the same time. 
I'm looking through cupboards. I'm rifling through them. I'm trying to decide whether I should try and get like a healthier kale snack or something or potato chips. And I'm rummaging. I'm trying to find where are the drinks. Do I, do I want to steal the beer? Do I just want to bring some soda? And in between, I see uh, there is this piece of paper stuck to the fridge. Like dad's best uh, spaghetti recipe. And then there's in the margins like, you stole this. <laughs> And suddenly I'm just walking around this house and because I'm interacting with it, because it's so familiar, by the end of it, I was just completely into this because I understood this kid and they were using things I knew. They were using motions and habits that I've become accustomed to. And no other form of media is really capable of doing that at the moment. And this extends as well to VR. Um, I remember in one interview with CCP Games, um, we talked about how they had a stop fighting simulator. And in this world, if you die, um, an injection is pushed into the pilot's brain, killing them so they don't have to suffer being, you know, exploded mm -hmm. in the middle of space and a clone is reawakened. And one of the designers talked about how early on they wanted to mess with the fact that VR is a weird thing for the human brain and force you to feel this jolt yep. when you're pulled out and cause a physical visceral reaction. Mm -hmm. I don't think it made the final cut because no one really wants to be sick consistently yeah. while learning a new thing. To be deliberately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, it's fascinating. Um, like like I just said, no other media is capable of doing that. Does your gaming game writing experience make it easier or more difficult for you to get immersed in something like that? Are you more critical of a game than someone who doesn't know how to write one of these? And and you know, absolutely. After okay. about eight years of game I would assume, yeah, um, doing game reviews as well, but. I think especially moving into game writing, even though I'm a lot more critical of a lot of elements, I'm also really aware of the science and artistry of what they're doing. And sometimes I see things that lead up to it and I'm like, oh, that is awesome. I know where you're going. And that is how many hundreds of people came to make this moment work. Mm -hmm. And I think on one hand, I'm more critical, but I'm also more deeply appreciative. Mm -hmm. And any, well, is it a uh, tendency to, Man, I am gonna lift that not not you know that thing itself, but you know that that trick or what what they just did there. I'm gonna figure out a way to to use something like that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure how how, how proprietary I guess that stuff is. Like, does someone get labeled a thief? Like, they're joke thieves and things like that. Is that a a phenomenon um, in that world? I don't think so. You would know yeah. if if somebody said, "Oh yeah, that none of that guy's ideas are any good. He's he's lifting." So cool. And where's writing going for you? I mean, you talked about, you know, cogitating on longer form, but... Um, I have a novel possibly in the works soon, several other novels that are still waiting for my attention, but I have a novella, which I read from in KGBW out in 2021, another secret project. No, basically there are a lot of things that are going well and none of them that I can talk about. Understood. So, but things are great. But they tend to be longer form. They're getting thinking? progressively longer. Yes. Okay. Just I growing. look forward to reading the stuff. Yay. Let me ask, where'd the name come from? Mm -hmm. Cassandra. <sighs> Is it your choice? It or? was definitely my choice. I was okay. in my teens. Yeah. No one would listen to me. Everyone would keep getting in trouble. <laughs> so I was kind of wondering if, if Oh God, yeah, it was <laughs> definitely what you thought. And the other bit that amused me was on one hand it was the prophetess who no one ever believed, even though they should have. And I figured like if I was going to be very perceptive. The original Cassandra didn't make use of it for herself, but I was going to, so all of it just kind of came together pretty well. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And that was Cassandra Call. Her books include series like Food of the Gods and Hammers on Bone, and she has some new work coming out next year, as we talked about, but we can't mention by name. Uh, but you should also check out her website, 
CassandraCaw.net to check out her fiction, poetry, essays, interviews, gaming articles, criticism, and more. That is C-A-S-S-A-N-D-R-A-K-H-A-W dot net. She's on Twitter and Instagram as Cass Caw, which is C-A-S-S. K H A W, and those will all be in the show notes for the uh, the episode. As will her uh, per story Patreon, which is Patreon dot com slash Cassandra Caw, and her coffee, which is K O dash F I dot com Cass Caw. Uh, again, links will be in the show notes uh, page. Check her out, support her work. Uh, she makes good stuff. And after we wrapped, I asked Cassandra, "So, who you been reading?" And if you want to hear her answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I promise I will get the fourth quarter 2019 episode up soon. This Japan thing really kind of took up a lot of my time. You can check out the third quarter episode featuring an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation, though, with Carl Stevens, Emily Nussbaum, Kate Mariyama, Lanier's, Christopher Brown, Caleb Crane, David Shields, Dawn Raffle, Amor Tolls, Simon Doonan, Simon Critchley, and Sylvia Nickerson. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, which I just got some good inspiration for, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at a murder hotel in Jersey City, along with last week's episode featuring Richard Kadri. No tolls getting down there, so it was just gas money and two bucks for coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. But if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual memory Show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think this show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. A special thanks go out to Jamie Anderson, Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Les Camella, Edie Nadelhaft, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Otaviani, George Fow, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, David Small, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We've got the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>